So hello and welcome to another episode of the Case Broadcast. And it's hello from me, Patrick Twitchett, the Simplifier. And it's hello from our guest today. Hi there, Patrick. How are you? <laughs> hello, Kirsty. Nice to have you with us. So as you can see, we're joined by Kirsty Birch today. And um, Kirsty, before we um, start uh, going down the lines of our conversation, can you please just let our guests know who you are and what you do so uh, they can get a little bit of an idea of where you're coming from, please. Yeah, of course. So I'm Kirsty Birch. I'm a mindset and business coach, recently transitioned from accountant. So this is a new field for me, exciting. <laughs> reason I became a coach and a motivational speaker is just because I have a lot of passion and I want to be able to get out there and instill as much confidence into people to be able to create their own opportunities, create their own businesses. And um, yeah, do you know what? Life's for living. So that's what I'm here to encourage. So, Excellent. No, that's good. And that's quite a transition, really. I think we've had conversations before because accountants do tend to find themselves in this bracket and and you know I know a lot of accountants and they don't all fit this mold but they're the general mold of an accountant is you know this nerdy sort of person that sits and, and, and can <laughs> sit, sit for hours reading spreadsheets and just get a real buzz out of a good spreadsheet but um they're not all the same and you've obviously taken that charisma and and pushed that more in a in a, in a direction that can help people which I think is great it really is so that's all good so um, I know we were going to cover um, the, the topics of confidence and imposter syndrome, which I think we all suffer from imposter syndrome in a lesser or greater degree, um, and, and how that can have an effect on us, not just in business, but, but in our personal lives as well. So do you want to take us through a little bit of the, the, the stages of that? Please, yes. Yeah, of course. And it's something that I've noticed. Well, I work with clients and it comes up often. So imposter syndrome, like you said, is not just a business, doesn't just affect people in business. I have people that as a on their personal life just doubt everything they do. They doubt yeah. their abilities. They feel like a fraud. They feel like they can't um they can't show off their achievements because they've got there in, in the wrong way or it's you know it's just frowned upon so all of these things is and it just restricts you doesn't it it really really does I think it limits anything yeah. you do then because you you limit yourself and you doubt everything along the way yeah yeah no it's true and you know we all yeah as we go through a career and I know from my own experiences you know I started off um, a little manufacturing company and and like any 18 19 year old I was the youngest there so uh, I'm making teas and coffees you know mm. if you know I'm going to do some grand things and then, <laughs> you know and and you know one of your first jobs is oh you know what project you need me oh no sit on this machine and punch a load of brackets out you know because you're the new boy um and as you progress through that career you know, when I ended up finding myself behind a manager's desk quite a few years down the line, you do have those fit thoughts, you know, hang on. So I'm the young boy and I'm now all the, the older folks are all coming to me to ask questions and I'm dealing with stuff. Yeah. And, and there is this sort of like, well, why me? Why am I here? How did I get here? And I've got no qualifications and et cetera, et cetera. And all those things just build up in your head, don't and they? And you saying that, Patrick, just the fact that you say no qualifications, that's one thing that generally affects a lot of people. If they achieve something because of hard work and they've worked their, you know, the way up the ranks, that qualification thing can come back and really hinder them because it's like, yeah, I shouldn't be here because I've not gained the right qualifications and I've not followed the right path as somebody else has done. That's the difference as well, where we start having that comparison, isn't it? And, you know, you can't compare yeah. life. Like, we're all different and everybody follows different paths. And you can stand out for all the right reasons and get that reward and you're, you achieve because of who you are, not just based on what you know. Sometimes it's how you portray yourself, isn't it? And how you, you know, you do a job just because you're not as qualified as somebody else. You could come in and do that job twice as good but you just haven't got the degree or the qualification for it. it doesn't mean that you're not capable of it, but it does affect a lot of people. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think that, you know, the state education system 
um, you know, it, it often gets knocked because it is all based on academia. And I know there's the, the, the famous poster based on Einstein's quote, you know, there's a, a goldfish, an elephant and a monkey in front of a tree. And that they say the next assignment is climb the tree. You know, so the monkey's all happy and the others are looking bewildered. And it is a little bit like that. You know, there's lots of people out there that have got practical skills, are great at woodwork, metalwork, sport, um, but academically they struggle. And they're all, all of a sudden they're labelled as some sort of failure because they don't meet the criteria, which yeah, is so really wrong. And so many times you hear of jobs where, um, you know, someone's come up through the ranks, they've got all the experience and they know the job, you know, right from the bottom to the top. And then a, a university graduate comes in who's got absolutely no life skills whatsoever, but just has a qualification. And you are so true. You know, they're, they're pretty much useless until they can get the experience. I so, think a lot of people fall into that box, that bracket. And I, yeah. I, I've worked with different companies, um, all different sizes. And I can tell you now that still happens a lot. It still happens mm -hmm. where I know people have been in a position and have been doing the position for a long time, never probably been given the acknowledgement of the actual role of this position, but they've been doing it. And then that position will come available. They apply for it. Somebody else will come in from a different department or a different, you know, internally and take that job because they've got the qualification. And it's like, it's a bit of a kick in the teeth. I think when especially for business owners if you want to instill confidence into your employees then work with them listen to what they're saying encourage them let them come up through the ranks and challenge them a little bit because practical yeah. you know, being more practical with something and actually doing the job well is more important sometimes than having a qualification isn't it so yeah yeah and, and obviously attitudes are part of that totally. um, and and um i know you know there's an element of confidence and you you know, there's the confidence that you have inwardly and there's also an outward confidence yeah. that you've got to express and show, especially as you sort of come into roles of management. You don't have to be dominating, but you have to at least have an air of confidence about you so people can trust in your leadership. But some of that's natural and some of that isn't necessarily natural. So... Could you tell us a little bit about sort of that natural confidence and then perhaps the, the sort of learn side of it? Yeah, of course. I mean, confidence is no one's born with confidence. We're all born the same, you know, so it can instill from, you know, your parents encouraging you when you're younger and, you know, peers and, you know, at school, if you're, you know, complimented a lot, if you do things well, that instills confidence into you, doesn't it? Because then you know that I'm, you know, I'm doing something the right way. People trust in what I do you then become that confident person where it actually starts to show on the outside by the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you apply yourself in just with, with everything in life. But not everybody has that. And it doesn't matter even like we just said now, if you've got that imposter syndrome that creeps in, it doesn't matter how good you do something, something can still limit you inside. And that's where you can start working on the external thing. So you can start becoming competently confident if it's a job related thing get good at your job get so good at your job that it, you know it outwardly expresses straight away that oh we can trust in what they do because they're actually physically showing what they're capable of some people can show up can't they and just totally yeah. wing it they can just literally yes and just be a confident person and they take on every challenge and they just you know grab every opportunity and they just go for it other people can do something for many years and still not have the confidence to be able to just speak to somebody about what they do, yet they're very good at what they do. So it's a really challenging subject, but that's one thing I really try to encourage because we've all got it in here. We all have these aspirations to be confident because we all know what opportunities it can bring. Secondly, also, everyone wants to be happy, to be confident and just be yourself. You know, it's a nice feeling, isn't it? So yeah, yeah, I sure. try to people, I work with my clients particularly just to work on you, do the inner work first. What actually do you want? Amount of people I speak to say to me, I wish I was like that person because look at just the way they walk into a room, they own it. Well, that's just because they want you to see that. They walk in because they're wanting to make that impression. Anybody can do that. You've just got to have, um, you've got to want to show up like that, haven't you? Totally. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know uh, we, we, we talk about disc profiling 
and the, the four sort of personality types and you know the the d is the strong confident manager type the i is the, the extrovert who can't stop talking uh, the s is that really nice friendly helpful person and the c is that introverted nerdy technical person and um i know in discussing that uh, f- for myself and i'm bringing myself into this here i i was very much an introvert from a young age very very quite happy in my own company but i i then realized you know in in the sort of the the early teens that not only was being confident something that made people stand out and help them achieve more but you know you know where girls were concerned that that obviously come into the, the factor <laughs> as well so it's obviously um, a good a good a good something to have so i become really a learned I. Someone actually called me that because I told them my story and they said, yeah, we were learned I. So it was learning to be Confident. a different person. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's fake. It just means it's it's like coming out of your shell, isn't it's it? Because it, it, it's easy, it's yeah. comfortable and it's safe inside that shell. But um, ships weren't built for the harbour, were they? So we can't sit in there I love that lives. you've done that. I love that you've done that because deep down, like you said, you've you had that in you. You just had to find a different way to express it. So you learn yes. that. You you learn traits, and it's not being a fraud at all. It's just practicing something till you perfect it. You know, it's yes. things like that, and you become a different person. You add to your personality. You don't have to stay a certain way. Everybody changes, and we all adapt to, as we grow. And that's a learning curve. That's for me is that's growing in confidence because it was enabling you to just step out of that comfort zone and try something different. And that's why you trying something different. Look what you do now. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, and and look, there's all let barriers and fears and the only way i ever found to overcome fear was just to face it head on i yeah. i remember being petrified to speak in public get up, getting up in front of the class to do that little talk for five minutes you know i was shaking like a leaf i'd probably be off school that day you know find some reason to to get out of it um and you know when you get into business and work and you find that you have to do these things you just you just throw yourself into it and do it but I mean, if you've got any tips that for someone listening now that's going, oh no, that's never me, you know, I couldn't stand up in front of a room of people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What tips could you offer to those people to to help them break those barriers, really? Well, firstly, main thing is look, com- confident comes from that Latin word confidere. That means to trust. So the main tip that I would say, suggest is start trusting who you are. Trust in what you can do. Trust in what your abilities are. Compliment yourself. When you achieve things, compliment yourself like you would anybody else. You know, oh, your hair looks lovely today. Oh, you've done really well. You've passed an exam or you've got a promotion. Recognize those achievements yourself and give yourself the credit for it because I think a lot of people don't do that. And, yeah, you know, it limits you totally. But get yourself some goals. Tick them off daily. So if it's just a little thing like talking to a stranger, you know, just having that confidence, just at a, you're at a bus stop, just make a conversation. If it's at work, just, you know, reach out to someone, just make, you know, do something different every day. Because if you don't, you stay still and, and you can't stay still. Like I said to you, you know, if you hadn't taken that, that risk and, you know, became that confident person that you are, you would have said, like you said, you'd have been that introvert still and you could have missed out on so many things. So get yourself some goals, yeah. start trusting what you can offer talk to somebody, make conversations, even if it's just, now you might think I'm a bit crazy here, but having that pose, if you're standing indoors and you just want to think, how does a conf person feel? Just put, you know, mimic the pose that you would expect them to be, that inner wonder woman. <laughs> you know, it's it's true though, isn't it? <laughs> Stand tall, put your neck out, you know, just, just have that bit of sense of awareness that what you want to achieve in life has already happened. Start feeling like you've already achieved it because I think then you get that little bit of spring in your step and it just gives you that, you know what, if you don't try it, you're never going to know, are you? And you only regret the things you never do. So by talking to someone, what are you going to lose? But yet you've got everything to gain from it. Yeah. Things, yeah. little things. 
Yeah, and I think you're right in, in, in the fact that it's smaller steps rather than the larger ones. Going to talk to a stranger, you know, don't you don't necessarily have to get up in front of a room of 500 people, um, you know, as your initial step, but you're going towards that direction. And um, I know when I, you know, did business networking events, they're, and they are incredibly intimidating when you've never done it before especially and you walk into a room and there's like you know 100 people maybe even if there's just 20 25 people and they all get their little huddles don't they? they're all talking and you're trying to break into that there is you've got to come in confidently haven't you oh totally and i think you know what they say picture other people who got their clothes on or something like that <laughs> it's things like that where it makes the other in your mind it's making the other person feel awkward rather than yourself you know it's all of these things but just remember that those hundred people that might be in that room if you're networking have not all been that confident i can assure you now they've all been through similar things and you know you're going to get some yeah. that are a bit more confident than others but you're all going to get everybody that still has that slight oh i don't know what to expect it's something there and you've got to embrace that because like I said, you've got opportunities. If you walk into a room of 100 people, you've got an opportunity to stand out, be that bit of a different person and be identified as being somebody that people want to be attracted to. Like, attract what you want. Attract the people that you want around you. And if that's confident people you want around you because it's going to increase your confidence, then associate with that. Start picking up the way other people talk and the other people walk. And like you said, it's not being a fraud and it's not changing who you are it's just adapting a little bit to your personality that you want to have but you don't know how to get it so just watch people it's not a bad thing to watch people to listen yeah just to listen to what other people talk like and how their language is it's things that we could think do you know what it's like you said those small little steps that you could implement can make all the difference and um 100 people in a room i'd be thinking you know, it's a little bit nerve wracking here, but you know what? Let's go for it. They don't know who I am. Even if I don't see them again, I've got nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah, very true. Very true. I, I know from my experience, I was, I was, I was um, in BNI for quite a few years, Business mm. Network International, and a lot of people find that quite intimidating. It's quite a, quite a full on environment. It's regimental a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, it's very regimental. <laughs> And it's, you know, everyone's got to do this certain thing. And then you're all told how you're meant to do your pitch. So if you're a little bit lazy, it really shows up to everyone else in the room because there's a certain way to prepare it. And if you just sort of wing it, people can tell. They will identify um, straight away. Yes, I'm with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> and, you know pe people think that, oh, I'll just wing this. But you can tell. But there was one particular guy who was very... He was very confident, he was very well spoken, and he winged it all the time. Well, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And but he got away with it because he just sort of, you know, got up and spoke a bit, and uh, <laughs> I'm I'm this is me, blah blah blah. And he was sort of speaking in this real sort of punchy way, and, and he had a little bit of humor in it, and everybody sat up and listened to what he had to say. And it wasn't because he'd really prepared anything a lot of the time. He just thought, you know, and I'd say to him, you, you completely winged that today. He went, oh, yeah, you know. Totally and you know what he done, Patrick? This is why I like this. He shifted your attention. He shifted yes. your attention to not be about his pitch at that point. He shifted your attention to be about what he was coming across like. And people will attract to that because they'll straight away look up and think, wow, do you know what? His pitch is really good there because he's, he's applying confidence there. Even if he's winging it, you would never have known because he, yeah, he switched your attention up in a good way. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think only because, you know, I've been in it so many years, I knew what someone who well prepared would come out with and, and what wouldn't. But to a complete stranger, it, you know, it was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, there'd be other people that would have prepared and prepared and they're sitting there you know, standing there with a bit of paper, their hands are shaking, you know, reading it off, stuttering and stammering. And, and you really felt for them. You wanted to encourage them because, you know, they were trying to break that barrier. Um, and, and it does, it just, you're, you're so, so right. It, you're focusing then on this person who's just 
yeah so it's confident. Way it. yeah it's yeah. Such, such yeah. a big thing and confidence really like you said as you walk into a room it can shine if you've got it people straight away will attract to you and not everybody appeals to that some people might find that people are a bit egotistic with it you know yeah yeah and it's it's not always like that I think it's just if you trust in what you can do you trust in your abilities doesn't matter what life throws at you then you're just going to go for it you know it's it's that kind of mentality I know when I do certain interviews I just prefer to just go off the cuff like we're doing now because I think you'll get a, a more of a raw and honest answer from me and it's an honest answer because I'm confident and I know what I'm doing so it shows like it reflects but I went to a B&I last week and what you just said, I had exactly the same experience. My first B&I, I had exactly the same experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so obviously this confidence and imposter syndrome are very intertwined, but they are two separate entities. Mm -hmm. So for those people that are listening to this and and they they sense they feel that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Firstly, firstly, tell us what are <laughs> sounds like it's a disease. What are the symptoms? No, you're right. You're right. There are certain traits. So yeah, you'll find that you will feel like you are doubting your abilities. You'll find that you're feeling like you can't um, accept your achievements. You know, and I find this a lot with high achievers as well. They generally set themselves high targets, and they always feel disappointed when they've not achieved them. Then. It's just too much of a pressure they apply to their self. I don't know what it is. I've noticed this a lot with high achievers, but it's definitely that not trusting what they do. Feeling like a fraud all the time. Feeling like you're always going to be exposed. No matter what you apply in life, it's no matter what job you do, whether it's, and even on a personal platform, always feeling like you're going to be identified as a fraud in some way. And that's got to be the most horrible feeling. Because yeah. you know, it's not a nice feeling to feel like no matter what you do at life, you're not doing it right. And that's that's not the case at all. And I think, like I said, stop comparing. A lot of people have imposter syndrome compare themselves to others. They compare what should be doing to what they're doing. And what people, you can't compare yourself to another person. It's the thief of joy, like I keep saying. You can't do that because everybody is different. You've just got to work on yourself. But main traits are, yeah. It's 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 that feeling of that fear a little bit on there of being shown as a fraud. It's it's exactly that. It's exactly that. Yeah, yeah. That someone's going to come out from the side and go, "Oh, I I know the real you. You're not yeah. really." But yeah, yeah. And 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 I think quite rightly what you say, comparison, comparison. Um, and I think in the modern world, social media, everything's out there a lot more. There's a lot more to compare yourselves yeah, to. Course. And it's quite intimidating, isn't it? It really is. It, it's intimidating. I mean, it can cause so many things. I mean, um, a, a classic um, era was the sort of the 90s with the Spice Girls and the size eight dress culture. Mm. And there's all these girls of different sizes all thinking that they need to be a size eight, which size eight probably isn't very healthy for most people, I wouldn't no, have no, thought. No, you're exactly, exactly right. And I think... The problem, I think, when you have imposter syndrome as well, you start to self-sabotage your own success before it's even happened a lot of the time. Yeah. You're already telling yourself you're going to be no good at it. Don't even bother doing it because, you know, you're not going to show up in the right way. People are going to doubt what you're doing. You're doubting your own abilities before you've even... This is probably why you find people with imposter syndrome don't apply for new roles. They stay still. They stay in the positions they're at. Like yeah. I said, they just try and give themselves a little bit more of a high achieving goal to achieve and they, and they don't do it, but they generally don't do anything different because to do something different is right. Okay. This could expose actually what I do. Let's just stay where I am. It's easier. And yeah. 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 It's well, it's the comfort zone scenario, yeah, isn't it? Rather it really than the stretch zone, it's, it's staying in the comfort zone, the, the boat, the ship staying in the Harbor. And no one's looking at you kind of thing. If I stay where mm. I am, no no eyes are on me. I haven't got to worry about what I'm doing. I just concentrate staying still. And it's that, like I said, all you do is self-sabotage your own success then. You don't progress. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and, and I think that, that safety aspect of it, because we all like a bit of safety and security, all yeah. us humans. It's a bit of a bad trait that we have. Um, and, and it does stop us going forward. 
So uh, an important point, I think, is not just to recognise this in ourselves, but also in, in people around us, in, mm. in our families, um, but in our teams that we work with as well. Um, because there are, you know, certain things, the way people talk, because your mindset will always come out, wherever your mindset is, will always come out in some yeah. way or form. Um, and it often comes out in our words and it's like, oh, you know, I could never do that or that's definitely not for me. And all these sort of phrases are almost alarm bells ringing in front of us to say... They're red flags. They are red flags. Yeah, They're yeah. How, how, can we, how can we combat that diplomatically rather than, you know, a full-on face, you know, I think set you yourself think together, man? <laughs> if you see your staff members, especially at work, if you, or others around you, you know, family members, anyone like that, if you hear that language, then adapt your language to them. So if it's like you're going to hear people saying, oh, I can't do that. And, um, you know, it's, oh, I'm, I'm never going to be any good at things like that. And if you hear that kind of language, just talk to them. You know, why wouldn't you be good at that? Tell me what skills you have got. What do you do on an everyday basis? So get them to talk about actually what they do do and what they are good at, and then put it to, well, why couldn't you do something different then? Why couldn't you? You do this every day anyway. So you have to change the way you talk to people and change your language to adapt to their needs because I think everybody, like you said, has a different way of learning. Everybody has a different way of growing. Everybody has all of these. Yeah. No one's the same. So adapt your language. And to be, for me as a coach, I can identify that now straight away because, like I said, the main rule of farmers coaching is you listen first. You know, you've got two ears and one mouth. Use it in that right way. So listen to what somebody's saying and just change it and it's not hard to start working with somebody to encourage their minds to think a little bit different you know try, try and create that vision there so that they can actually see do you know what it's not as scary as what I thought it was going to be or actually I can achieve that because I'm already doing it change it up just talk to people that's all it is I think when you talk to people rather than like you said making it such a big problem you get more conversation out of somebody and you'll get more answers as well. Yeah, yeah. And it's diluting it down then, isn't it? If yeah. you can nurture and just give that encouragement over the conversation rather than, a, you know, the confidence lecture. Um, but there's like that drip fed um, bits of confidence that you can put into that conversation. Nothing worse than telling somebody and I'll hear this a lot, especially this is why I want to go and work into schools and things like this, because there's nothing worse telling somebody that, well, you need to just get more confident. You need to get out there and try things. You can't, if someone hasn't got that, you can't, they're, they're just going to freeze even more because then they're going to know that you've picked up on an element of what they're trying to hide for so long. You've got to nurture them. Like you've just said, you've got to say, come on, what could you do differently? What excites you? What, what's your visions? What's your goals? You know, get them to actually think outside of that box and imagine that life outside of that box. How could you get there? You know, all of these things they will have the answers to themselves. They'll know in their own minds. They know what they should be doing. They know how they should be getting there. They just can't get there. So you just need to be that little vehicle, don't you? Just to come on, let's, you know, let's do it together. Let's move through it together. And it doesn't take long. Like you'll notice, motivational speaking doesn't take long once you get up and do it once. The second time you can't shut them up. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. It's yeah, like they've come out of this massive like box and thought, that's it. It's like a jack in the box. I'm here now. Let's go. And yeah, that's what yeah. you've got to do. Just nurture people. Not everybody like, you know, develops and learns in the same way. Everybody is different. So if people are a little bit slower to pick something up, then just nurture them. And like you said, small, consistent steps, you know, wins the race, doesn't it? So it does it does and I think it's that fear of the unknown it I always like it I like I like swimming and I always liken it to the swimming pool because you've always got the one person that that keeps tiptoeing around the edge tipping their toe in and then they'll walk around a bit more and tip their toe in uh, as if it's going to be a different temperature walking <laughs> around the corner um and then there's someone else who just legs it out of the changing rooms just bombs straight into the water um you know, you're, you're both going to have to get in eventually. Um, so there's either, you know, mess about at the side 
or just get in and do it and just go for it yeah just go for it patrick you're so right and you know what i'm a listen i'm a walking talking example of this at the moment this is exactly you know i've stepped out of something that i've known for what nearly 20 years in my life but yeah yeah industry. And I've, you know, I became a fitness instructor three years ago, not because of any financial reason, just because it was a challenge and I wanted to do it. I like that motivational side. And then the coaching just kind of came naturally. And I thought I could look at this and go into it like this is new to me. The last sort of year or two's worth of work I've been doing with it. This is new to me. There's people out there been doing it longer. I do not care about that because they're not me. They're totally not me. And I'm a different person to that. And everybody has different values, doesn't they? Don't they? So yeah, yeah. don't be frightened or fearful to try something new. And you're never too old. You're never too old to learn. You know, the, the world, you know, we're, the world is here to learn from, you know, take every opportunity, every experience that you have in life, whether it's a negative or a positive, it's a lesson to be learned from it. And just grab the positive lesson from it. And grow from that. And if it means that you've got to step out of your comfort zone and try something new, don't be fearful. Because, like I said, you only regret the things you don't do. Last thing I want to do is get to, if I live to 90, I don't want to get to 90 and think, I never did that. I never did that. And that's regret, isn't it? And who wants to live like yeah. that? Yeah, that, you know, that's something that, that, that haunts me a lot. But, you know, I've seen, you know, I've been around relatives and people I know that have passed away. And, you know, you look at that person laying in the bed sometimes, you think, oh, you know, I'm going to be there one day. You know, one day that is, you know, there's no getting around it. One day that's going to be me. And I don't want to lay there and think, oh, if only, what if? It, it's the last was, thing you want to be thinking about yeah, to help you. You like that. Yeah, you know? you absolutely. That. So, so yeah, it, it, it's a case of, you know, we are, like you said, we are our own worst enemies. That the, the real person that's stopping us from doing it is ourselves. It yeah, we, we try and blame everyone else or everything else. <laughs> You've oh, got it's to be accountable. You've got to be accountable. It's because I haven't got any money. It's because <laughs> of this person and what they said to me when I was three years old. And it's like, well, yeah, okay. There's things that happen to us in our life. But when we find out what those things are, don't use that as a crutch. Don't use that as a defence of why you haven't done anything. Use it as, okay, that's something that needs to be overcome and overcome it and move on from that. Use Don't use the baggage you. the way you did. Yeah, it. use it to fuel your growth. So look yeah. at it like a... This is one thing, I mean, I've come from, an, you know, as I don't know if you've read my story and stuff like this, but I hadn't had the most opportunity, you know, I didn't have the most opportunity available readily to me when I was younger. I did come from a bit of adversity and I could use this as an, ex, you know, excuse not to achieve it. Yeah. And I think, no way, that's somebody else's actions. I can't, I can't, um, you know, morph my life around the way somebody else is acting. Okay, it might have shaped me a bit, but it hasn't defined, it doesn't define who I am as a person. I choose to be a bit of a different person. I choose to have a different life. I don't, if I choose to allow that to consume me, that's my choice. And that's, that's my own fault. Then I'm, I, you know, I'm an adult now. I've got my own mind, my own, I can get out and do anything I want to do. I'm never letting somebody else limit me and be accountable. Once you start being accountable for your own actions, you can't be accountable for somebody else's actions. It's happened. I'm yeah. all about moving forward. You know, you can't change the past, can you? You can reflect on it and learn from it, but you can't change it. But what you can do is change what's happening now and, and you to fuel your growth, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's the now that moulds our future. Of course, you know? yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. So um, so 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 going back to you, you touched on you there, Kirsty. And I think it's important because anyone listening to this now, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you now. We've, we've had conversations before and, you know, you're coming across nice and confident, you know, <laughs> but that doesn't mean to say that when you were, you know, six months old, you started going, well, I'm Kirsty, right, what's going on? What's happening? Let's have it. You know, yeah. it, you, how were you growing? I mean, were you, you know, you do see these confident children but you I know, think I was, I was a confident phases. kid yeah I was I was a confident kid experiences around things that were going on around me um probably like affected me not as much as I I didn't allow them to to be fair Patrick when I was younger I think I looked around and thought I don't like these experiences that I'm seeing at the moment I don't like you know the way certain things 
happening around me. I, I, yeah. I there was a lot of adversity. I've come from a council estate. I come from where benefits are probably normalised. You know, there wasn't opportunities always there, but I always had that belief in me to think that I'm going to do something different with my life. And I think a lot of people that probably have experienced a bit of adversity do do something different with their life because they want more. They've never had it. So they want to find out what this world is about. And for me, it was, yeah, from a youngster, I probably, I was a, com- I was very confident at school, probably not as confident like in my home life, just because like I said to you, I didn't have the greatest there. So as I got to sort of 15, 16, I just thought, you know what, this is my time now. I'm, you know, it's going to be 16. I'm leaving school. So this is my time to make a difference. I don't have to allow you know, my parents' um, problems to affect who I am. And that was it. And then at 17, I fell pregnant. (laughs) (laughs) Crap, I don't know what to do now. And probably not part of the plan, that one. No, I wanted to go to university. I had all these aspirations. At 17, it was like, I've got to really grow up now because you become responsible for somebody else, don't you? It's not just about you. I had my child and that was it. That's when I went into accounting and I thought, I've got a different personality and I've got a different energy. I can, just because I've had a child young, that's not going to stop me from achieving. So I literally done night school. I went to I'd done day releases. I got all my exams under the way and I just did it and built it slowly. And obviously, because that's all I could do with child and background. It was, it was tough. It was challenging. Not what my plan was. However, it's probably made me more determined in life now because I had to not prove a point, but I suppose to myself, I had to prove that point that, okay, next step, right, what are we going to do now then? Because throughout my life, there's always been challenges. And if you allow those challenges, like I said, to consume you, you don't move forward. And I'm not doing that. So now my daughter's nearly 21. I'm 37. She's 21 this year. So it's a big difference. But I've now instilled that into her and to my other two children. They're, they're all girls. They all know their sense of worth. I try to instill as much confidence as I can into them because I want them to go out and live life to the fullest and not ever feel like they've got to limit what they do in life because somebody else tells them they can't or they like you said fall into a box because people look at certain statistics and you are probably as a child I was probably a statistic you know she come from a council estate her parents you know my dad especially wasn't the greatest role model and it's like probably never going to achieve anything and then I fell pregnant probably fell right into the statistic you know but yeah yeah that's right you know what it's at 19, I bought my first house. So I was on it, you know, straight away from 17. I thought, right, I've got two years now. Let's get out there. I've got a full-time job. Me and my husband, we bought our first house together. We've been together since we were young. And we've just challenged life every time we've had, you know, that head-on approach. And I've just grown more in confidence because over the years, all these challenges and I've overcome, it made me realise how resilient I am and what I can achieve and what I can do. So when you actually start trusting who you are, like I said, it makes a big difference because it doesn't matter what anybody else says to you, then you know what you can achieve yourself and what you've got with inside. So you've just got to just literally focus on you, do the inner work and the rest after that gets e- it becomes easy then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, responsibility and accountability um, go hand in hand. And, and, and like you say, you, you could have said, oh, I'm pregnant now at 17, yeah. you know. Um, this is going to affect my life and hold me back. But, no, you took the right attitude. I mean, I was a dad at 20, so I know the feeling of, yeah. oh, well, I've got to grow up here. You know, it's like a big And it's overwhelming. Now. You can allow it to overwhelm you, can't you? Or you can use it to fuel you. And this is exactly yeah. it. And you know what? I remember telling yeah. myself, even at 17, and I've got no disrespect to anybody that claims benefits or anything like that. I was brought up on that. So it's not nothing like that. But I just always told myself, I'm not going to have that life for my child. I want to give them more, you know, and just because I didn't have it. I've never claimed a benefit. Even at 17, I just thought, right. So I worked night work. I worked day work. And that's just what I did because I wanted to give them a different, you know, show them different examples in life, what you can achieve if you put your mind to it. So and yeah. hopefully I've instilled that into my children because they're all quite strong young girls, probably too strong sometimes, Patrick, because I think, what have I done? Now they're arguing with me. <laughs> but at least I know that if, when they go into the big wide world or they get boyfriends or whatever they do, they'll be able to look after themselves and stick up for themselves because they'll be confident, you know? So that's that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah. And, I've, you, know, you know, when we, we talk about uh, the difference, male and female as well, you know, the, the fact that, uh, women can be allowed 
to be more confident now. And it's not strange for a woman to be confident. It's accepted and it's it's the normal now, which is not how it was perceived you know what, you know, back in my younger days. No, you know, no, you're right. like, I, I we had to be to timid my... little people. And, and again, that's nan. a syndrome in itself, isn't it's it? So, you are so right. Seriously, I spoke to my nan yesterday and my nan is in her 70s, OK? And that era is like, I, was just, I think you was more, you stayed at home, you did the cooking and cleaning. And I know yeah. that people are going to like that, but that was what the era was like. It and was. the members work, you know? My nan, even now, my granddad's probably quite hard work. He's, she just still just gets on with it. And she said the one regret she probably got in life is probably not having her own voice a lot of the time. Probably not speaking out as, yeah. you know, just being, saying no to things or she just doesn't, you know, approve of something. She might, she still, my nan's not a quiet lady, but there's still lots of reservations there in herself. And she said, I wish I just had that confidence to just say, no, I'm not doing that. Or I'm just going on holiday. My granddad doesn't like going on holiday, so my ne- nan's never gone unless I've taken her. It's things yeah. like that. And I think, nan, you know, those, you, you've missed out. You're 70 something. It's never too late. You know, and she's no. thirsty, but she's, I think she's just accustomed to that now. But you're right. She said, I look at this younger generation and I admire them because I think you've got a voice now. And when we was that age, I didn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was probably frowned upon to have that. Whereas now it's encouraged, isn't it? Which is a good thing. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, and um, America and the American movies of the 50s yeah. sort of typified it, didn't they? You know, yeah. she sat home and do the ironing and the cleaning. And and it, it was so stereotypical. And, and when you think of history, probably more has happened in the last 30 years to change things than had happened in the previous 3,000 years, whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's quite scary, but it's good to be part of this time where things are really now evolving and stepping up. And people, there is more equality out there. Um, and again, you still got to grab that equality. Like you said, you know, had it inside of her. She just didn't express it. And now people got that freedom to express it. And all that's holding us back is us. That's exactly it, Patrick. That's exactly it. So I'm trying to coach her now. I'll just give it a couple of six months. And I'll <laughs> changes. Yeah, yeah. It'd be a great testimonial, wouldn't it? Yeah, it will. And, you know, because obviously, you know, in, in the example of you now, she's had that mindset and walked that path um, for so many years. You get stuck. It's like a rut, isn't it, in the road? It's only because you keep going down that same path, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And it's harder to then climb out. You know, a rut, a rut is basically a grave with the ends knocked out. You know, you've got to be careful that you don't get into a set way. And it is difficult for someone to change. Do you know what? The fact that my nan talks about it shows that it actually still impacts her. Yeah. So I mean, like when I talk to her, it's still something that is that centre of that conversation. You know, she's not afraid to talk to me about anything like that. And... I, I can tell by the way her actions are that, like you said, she's got it in her. She just doesn't know how to express it. And man, you can do anything. You know, why don't you, you know, the fact she's, I've taken on two, three holidays. Me now we've gone, obviously taken her abroad. My nan's never done any of that. My granddad doesn't like going on holidays. So she's always, she's always wanted to do these things and never had that opportunity. And now it's like, well, now I'll go with, I'll go with my granddaughter. Then, you know, she does do that. But even that was quite a scary thing for her to be able to say, I'm going to do this now, but yet probably quite exhilarating. Probably yeah, quite good for powerful. her. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. But we'll see what she... Uh, the fact is, my nan has still got not one grey hair. She still dyes her hair that auburn colour. She's still <laughs> in her 20s, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she hasn't She hasn't gone down the road of purple rinse yet. So no, no, <laughs> she's still got her auburn hair because she was auburn younger. She looks exactly the same, to be fair. Maybe aged a little bit, but for when I envision her as a youngster, she hasn't changed one bit. However, <laughs> she's getting that more now... Um, wanting to just step into herself a little bit which is nice but like you said mm. in, um, 70 something is she she i think she probably thinks now this is you know the path you just follow but but you, like you like you said you're never too old you're never too <laughs> old to change and, and do those things I, I think i and i always quote um uh, it, it's it's historical and biblical because they all talk, always talk about moses going down into egypt yeah when he went down into Egypt, he was 80 years old. 
Was he so really? When, I so I when you think like of that. that, that's what well, I always use that because, you know, people say, oh, yeah, I'm a bit old. Well, he was 80 when he went down and then he had to lead the people 40 years in the wilderness. So, you know, uh, for 120, that weren't too bad. So you can't really put age as a barrier, really. When you, when no, you look you've at just got to like change that. your mindset. And if your mindset yeah. changes, then there's always that room for, do you know what? It's, it's change, isn't it? Change is scary, but yet change is so rewarding. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's we're never too young either. And, and sometimes we can have that label of we're too young to achieve this. We're too young. This is why I want to go into schools, because I think, do you know what? Yeah. Prevention is better than cure. And there's a lot of youngsters, like you said, are very impressionable at the moment. And also a lot of youngsters that don't really understand the real world in regards to financial stuff and budget. I don't think we teach enough stuff like this at school anyway, where no. children are aware of what, you know, today's world, it's a lot harder to get on the mortgage, you know, it's on the, on the property lad. It's just, you, you've got to be able to talk them through some certain life skills, but also encourage them to talk openly without how they feel in their mindset. If they're struggling now, you've got an opportunity to, to change the way they are before they get to that young adults, you know, especially at like A-levels or something. They're going to go and do things that they've never done in their life or they're going to come across all these, you know, obstacles, that, but they encourage them to look through the obstacles and to see what's around them that they can use to benefit them and see things differently different perspectives and that's why i want to go in because you're right you're never too young either you know you work with people when they're that impressionable age you can really um you can really help them before they get to sort of young adults 100 percent. yeah yeah and we're much more impressionable at that age so yeah it's, it's a great time to catch people um so so um so really we need to sort of sum up at this point but Relating this back to you know, a lot of our audience are involved around work or business, taking this into from the business perspective, um, and I know we talked about a lot of families and, and socially and everything else, but in a business perspective, how can people take this to apply themselves more um, in, their, in their business direction? Um, you know, rather than, oh, I've given you a quote, oh, they, they said no, and walk away with your head down. How, how, how can people apply this more in their business life to become more successful? Engage with people, have conversations with people. Like you just said, if you've given them a quote and you've not heard a response, speak to somebody. You never know because people buy from people, don't they? They, they don't do. buy just because of a 100%. product or a service. You know, they buy from people. Give them the service that they want. A bespoke it, a bit adapt, just change it up. Like I said, speak to people in a different language that, you know, benefits them so that they feel like you're talking directly to them. And if that means that so your employees as well to encourage that confidence and growth within your employees, then, you know, encourage that growth. Give them the opportunities. Listen to what they're saying because... If you ask the questions, you're going to get the right answers. And if you're at work and you're thinking, you know, I want to go for a promotion, I want to do this, I feel like I'm worth that, then say it. it show why you're worth that. Actually take the time out to show your employees why you think you're worthy of this promotion or pay rise, because those are the people they want to step up because you're actually taking ownership of what you want. If you can yes. do that as a person, to me, I'd be thinking, well, okay, then they're, they're showing their worth and they're confident in their approach. And it doesn't have to be you're fully confident in regards to expressing confidence. If you know you do a good job at work and you know that you're worthy of that, you know, next step, like you said, then put it on paper, go with, a, a, go to your boss and literally give yourself that opportunity. You don't have to show confidence there, but you can have it written down why you're worthy of something. You'll come out of that meeting just feeling like that little bit more, that little one more step you've achieved. And as business owners, get out there and go for it. You want to run a successful business, start working on yourself. Start doing the inner work first. Start working on your mindset. Start facing those fears. Start Stop comparing yourself to others and start remembering why you went into it and what your values are and what you want to achieve. Stick, know what you want. And like I said, once you stop worrying about others, then it, there's no competition then anyway, is there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I always say that your, your business will only grow as big as the person that you become. And yeah. it's so true. That is what tends to limit 
a business is, is it's the business you know, owner yeah the owners and the leaders in that business is there you know they if they have limiting beliefs it just surrounds the themselves with like-minded people patrick and that's it absolutely if yourself, or if you if you've got people that are of a toxic energy then speak to them encourage them to talk encourage them to find out why that energy is there and if it doesn't work then you have to think of yourself and your business in a sense because if you've got the wrong energy around you everybody will feel that so yeah you have, yeah you can't have that energy around you've got to think that abundance especially with business success abundance positive you've got to have that you know you've got to have that right energy around you and that, that confidence will just add to that add yeah to that. yeah yeah and I, I think they say they say the figure's about five isn't it the, 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 the five people that you associate yourself with the most you will be the compound result of that and i always say it's not an addition it's a multiplication because mm. I was, you know, you're an accountant. I was quite into maths. And if you times anything by zero, it doesn't matter. The others could be 10. They could be 50. Yeah. It will come out zero. And you, you have to take those, uh, what I call them mood hoovers, um, out of your life. Um, doesn't mean you ignore them completely. You just have it under control. Everybody comes into our life for a reason, don't they? And that's one thing I have learned now is that you can't, um, you meet people in life as you walk through your journey. It doesn't mean you have to keep them in your life. It just means you've met them. You've taken something from them. You've chosen whether you want to, you know, keep them in your life. And if you don't, then you just keep moving. And you don't have to feel guilty over that. It's just not right oh. for you. And that's it. No, you're, you're spot on there. Um, because there is this thing, and I know British culture is very much like it, it's quite cultural around the world. You know, the, these people are family, so I have to spend time with them. But very often, people can have really toxic people in their close family. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to disown them. It doesn't mean that you have to never, ever see them ever again. But it just means, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do, but it's true. You know, you don't have to go and see them every weekend. No, you you're like, this is exactly my them. family now. I, I choose to, I've got no agnostic to anybody. I've got no grievances with anybody. I have no problem. Like life is, it is what it is. And for me, I've just taken it as a, every lesson or every experience I've been in, I just take it as it's, it was meant to happen and I've learned from it. So I look at it that way. But do I choose to have all that any them toxic energies around me? No, just because they might be family or relatives and close family as well. I can't have you around me because you're not you're not good for my soul. <laughs> so I have to identify yeah. that and I, and listen to my own needs. And that's as selfish as some people might sound. That it's not for your own mental health. I think as well, you have to do what's right for you. And if a certain energy is not right for you, then limit them and do never feel guilty for it because. It, it will only bring you down so it's not a good thing anyway you have to weigh up the pros and cons don't you and have a good balance definitely definitely and i will put in a disclaimer there that any of our friends and family that are listening to this episode uh, we do love you and just because you haven't been about to see you, you yeah, just because <laughs> you haven't been to see you there might not necessarily be you just so you know <laughs> i love that <laughs> okay so um thanks ever so much for sharing that today. So if any of um, our audience, anyone listening to this says, I'd love to get in touch with Kirsty, what is the best and easiest way for them to get in touch with you, Kirsty? So I obviously have my main website, which is www.kirstybirch.com, or if you're on LinkedIn, you'll find me as Kirsty Birch or Facebook or Instagram. I'm the same um, profile all around. But yeah, or drop me an email, guys. So it's info at kirstybirch.com. If you want to find me, you'll find me. Yeah, 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 <laughs> cool. And that's Kirsty with an I and Birch with an I. That's it? it, yeah, that's yeah. it. Excellent, excellent. Cool. So we're going to move on now to um, what I always term as, as my favourite round, the favouritism round. And it's just so our audience can get to know you, as a person a little bit better. So we've got okay. some quick fire questions, just um, a little bit about you and what your favorites are. 
Okay. okay. So we're going to start off, first of all, with your favourite pastime or hobby. So I like to, um, I like history. People might find that a little bit strange, but I do like a bit of history. And okay. I like, I like going to museums. I like just, you know, take me to the Battle of Hastings. I like all of those things, you know, it's just me. <laughs> I like learning about things that have happened in the past. And, but I'm also good. I teach fitness classes, like I said to you, on mini trampolines. I do, I do random stuff, Patrick. I'm all about that high energy. And then I like to have a little bit of a chill time by going to a uh, popping around some museums or just, you know, just going out for the day and just, I, I just like learning things. Take me to Heathrow Castle, listen yeah. to the history there. There's so much to, to learn from it. And it's, you know what, it's, um, it's just, it's just amazing. The world, you know, the world we've, we all live in now is not what it used to be. So I like just hearing pastime things. So. No, that's cool. That's cool. And, and I think we can learn a lot from history as well. So what's your, What's your favourite period of history? I like um, I like the Tudors. Oh yeah. Oh, it was really. I think I used to go to a school where Anne Boleyn actually resided, so it was her main bit where where I come from. Sort of, it was in Kent that part. So oh, it was right, very okay. yeah, it was very um, you know, you knew that when the school that you was within her the part that she resided in was very common knowledge at our school. But yeah, I just find it intriguing in Victorian times. I think all of these things here is just a it, it, the world was a different place, and uh, this is what also makes me realise how lucky we are to live in this world now. Like the amount of things, you know, World War Two. Ask me anything. Well, not ask me anything. World War Two, but you know, I I really liked World War Two at school because I found it fascinating just the way people lived and adapted. Can you imagine the resilience that they have back then? Yeah. Like we don't, oh, yeah. Today's world's a little bit more pampered, I think, compared to what we're watching. Massively, what we're massively. We're all whinging about lockdown and people like Piers Morgan are going, oh, you know, people come through World Wars are smart with you, you know. <laughs> we don't and, live uh, with rations. We're rationing toilet rolls. They had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Indeed. Indeed. So, it, yeah, it, it, it's so true. And, uh, yeah. Uh, good old Tudors, Henry VIII and all that. It's, well, uh, he was definitely one to be remembered, I think, wasn't he, for his um, antics, shall I say? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. He leaves every, all these other royals uh, standing. Uh, <laughs> tales of scandal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. Excellent. Very good. Um, so your next favourite, uh, your favourite celebrity from any field and why? Right, so I have a couple of favourite celebrities. I am, um, I like certain singers. I don't know if I wrote this part down for you, but I do like, I'm, I'm big, I'm very into soul music. So I like big, powerful women voices, Adele, Mariah Carey, Reefa Franklin. I'm, I'm big on those. But the celebrities I do like, I'm a big fan of The Rock for obvious reasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I'm a big fan of The Rock. I like uh, comedy. I love uh, Steve Harvey, Kevin Hart, all of these things. Because do you know what? Life for when you laugh, it's infectious. And for me, I love a bit of comedy because I, you know, yeah. you can't take life too seriously sometimes, can you? And then they apply the uh, the motivational side to it, especially with Steve Harvey and The Rock. They have that motivational, inspiring, um, you know, that message, and I, I just like that. So, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know a great deal about Steve Harvey's background, but I know The Rock. He was, I think he was very inspired by Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. in a way he wanted to be in the movie. So he became, you know, this big muscly guy and said, you know, there'll, there'll be a way for me. And, you know, he achieved all, all what he said. And he did. And you know what? He didn't have the most, again, readily available opportunities. And sometimes you make good what you've got, don't you? And then if you've got that passion and drive, you, you, you know, you go for it. Yeah. And I, mean, I think The Rock, he wanted to be in movies and he knew, I think he's, was it his dad was a wrestler, I think. Yeah, wasn't something like that, yeah. And so he wanted to follow in the footsteps, become that personality, you know, get the big muscles and everything. And and now he's in the movies, you know. They... And he gives back so much as well. And I think this is what I, yeah. I really like, that you can succeed so much in life. And it's all about that being grateful for what you've got and giving back. And I like what they do. They give back. When you can that's give right. back, it's so, um, that's more rewarding than any financial gain sometimes, isn't it? So Definitely. Most definitely, most definitely. So moving on from these uh, wonderful celebrities, um, your favourite food or meal? 
<laughs> no, no, I'm a cheap date. I did write this. Anybody else? I'm always on a diet because I'm always trying to watch what I eat because I'm a, I'm a greedy cow, let's be fair. So um, my favourite, easy, a nice chicken kebab. It's cheap. It's healthy. I'm ha happy all day. I'll eat anything, Patrick. I'm not fussy, but chicken kebab, my go-to. Cost my husband <laughs> probably a tenner. <laughs> there we go. Nothing special about me. I see it. And I still come away feeling good because it's nice and healthy. So there we go. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> oh, now here we're getting on to my, my real favourite favourites here. What is your favourite cartoon? Now, I'm a big Warner Bros fan. When I was younger, I liked Warner Bros. I like Tweety Pie. So, you know, so okay. like all of those things. Yeah, the Looney Tunes. As well. I, I, love, I love Disney. Um, I think they're amazing with the creativity they do. Toy Stories is iconic, isn't it? Everybody knows Toy Story. It's been around for years now. But, yeah, I, I love all of those things because I think the imagination's there, especially with the Warner Bros. You know, they've been around years, and that imagination's there and creativity. Someone had that idea and put that into place. I think it's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And anything can happen in a car too, can't it? You know, and it's probably... a little bit edgy, I think, the Warner Bros. riders as well. It's not just a uh, <laughs> happy ending, is it? We all know that with Roadrunner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I was going to say Roadrunner, you know, you know it's always going to go wrong. But they're very well thought out, the little stories. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> always makes me smile. Good, good. So here we go. What is your favourite film? Well, I'm a Harry Potter fan, massive Harry Potter fan. I will watch all of the Harry Potters back again, back again. I don't know why I've seen them about a million times and I'll still watch them. I went to the Warner Bros... Um, you know, the Harry Potter world. And I don't know if I ruined it all for myself now or not. I tried not to get involved too much because I've got this vision. But I also, Dirty Dancing, can't be a bit of Dirty Dancing, can you? <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. I, you know, I never saw that when it came out. I saw it quite a few years later. But, yeah, what a fantastic story. And no, I think a... it was Patrick Swayze that just sold it for everyone. So well, I, I think I think <laughs> you might be right. I mean, I, not really uh, my thing, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And and apparently he, he had quite a lot of his own troubles, didn't he? In, in his Do you life. know what? Again, this is what he, I think it just shows you that people can show up in different ways, can't they? People yeah. on a different front, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, he, he's an actor. You know, you're you're showing something else. Um, but behind the scenes, you know. And I think behind the scenes, him and... Um, oh, I've forgotten her name. Who played the, the, the lead lady in it? Oh God, I've got it, baby. I can't remember her name. Jessica, Jennifer. Oh, I can't remember her surname now. You know, I always know her name normally, but anyway. Yes, I'm thinking, um, I can't remember her name now. They, they didn't get on. No, they didn't. No. Well, and yeah. uh, there was a lot of contention. Now, I think he was quite a perfectionist, so and he was quite a good dancer. So I would imagine there was a lot. I read something on him, Patrick, and you know what? He was like a ballet dancer when he was young. I think his mum was a teacher or something like that. She young. was, yeah, and yeah. He actually perfected what he could do as a dancer was I mean amazing and then he went into acting so I think it was obviously inevitable that that film was always going to be made for him but yeah he was very very talented man very talented yeah yeah and I think he was probably old enough to be a dad when he played the role I think <laughs> <laughs> which is a little bit creepy uh but he did he did look very young his age which did, uh, which, which 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 brought more balance in the film but yeah so <laughs> harry potter so when you say harry potter world well, ruined it for you i mean because that's is that north of london that is yeah so we went to there only at christmas and i think it's all behind the scenes you know the setups and, yeah. the and they showed you where things were filmed and i'm thinking oh god like it was amazing to see because obviously you've got to now put that creative mind in and actually think, wow, they've actually created a scene out of this and made it look real. But yeah. when you actually see where they filmed it, I think it's a little bit, oh, OK, as, as somebody that really likes Harry Potter films, it, I don't know if it took the, the element of surprise. Maybe I should have just left it as I... This is why <laughs> I won't go to New York and watch... Because I love Friends, one of my favourite like, programmes, and I've put myself off going to New York to go to, to the actual Friends setup because I think that would totally ruin it for me <laughs> so you're expecting all these these grand sets i don't, I don't know what i expected it were what a fault it was amazing when i got there to look at all the stage and the way it was filmed but you know where they filmed most of the, the you know if you watch harry potter in regards to where the 
their, their dorms were and where their bedrooms were. It was a tiny little room and they've made it look like that. And I thought, I think that's just took that away now. So half yeah. of the stuff I didn't engage in too much because I didn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got a little Harry Potter story because someone I knew, he was uh, worked at a laser cutting company and, and he was often asked to go and do stuff for movie sets and he went, he went down to the Harry Potter set for one of the films. I think it was Ralph Fiennes played um, Voldemort, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And um, apparently he'd recorded this scene before and the scenery fell on top of him. No! <laughs> and it was all made out of wood. So they wanted this stuff done out of steel so it held itself up. And, and he said he was such a nice guy and he said he'd come out of his caravan and he was all made up as Voldemort, you know. All that would be scary in itself, wouldn't it? <laughs> and, yeah, and he said, and he looked at me and he says, oh, are you the man that's going to save me from near death um, by making some scenery that doesn't fall on top of me this time? <laughs> and he said he was so nice, and he said he invited me into his trailer and we had, we had, a, we had a drink and we had a little chat wow. for an hour. And it was just like, you know, that was now, really how, nice when to did hear you that. have that claim to fame that you had tea with Voldemort? Like, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, moving on from Harry Potter now, so what is your favourite TV show? Well, I, I like a lot of crime stuff. I wanted to be a detective. I always oh, wanted to you? be a detective. Even now, I thought, well, could I? Because I know you can... Well, you're never too old, Kirsty. No, you're never too old, but I also know it um, takes a lot of time up and it's a lot of work, and I don't think my family would appreciate that anymore. So I have to be a, you know, a little bit less, you know, I think of other people now. <laughs> but I like watching lots of crime ones, you know, put Vera on for me or put a, a bit of a silent witness. Even the bill, I will go back and watch the bill. I'm... <laughs> but nobody else to watch it with me, Patrick. So if I'm going to do that, I have to record it and watch it at six in the morning before anybody gets up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Again, it's um, I think I just like all those crime solving things and friends. Like I said, you can't beat a bit of friends. So yeah, a good bit of friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, do you know what? I've never watched Friends. Have you not? Oh, do you know what? You are probably the second person I've ever met that's ever said that. You know what <laughs> yeah, there's, we're very rare. The people that have never watched it, to be fair. But yeah, it is so popular. Everybody says to me, oh, yeah. It's a oh. bit like Star Wars Day. It was Star Wars Day yesterday, and I had a few people I'd seen on the social media, and I've never watched Star Wars. Oh, well, I, I don't know if we should continue this conversation then, Kirsty. I mean, <laughs> I've, been, uh, <laughs> I've never watched Star Wars. I'm not a Star Trek person. My husband likes Star Wars. Doesn't it? I don't think I probably ever would. A bit like you with friends, I just think I've got no intention to do that either. Well, look, we should make a deal here. If I'm going to watch an episode of Friends, you need to watch the first ever Star Wars film. Oh. There we go. We, we, we strike a challenge for the two of them. Okay, cool. So, um, so the final one, and this is this is a favourite of mine. I know you like comedy. I love comedy too. Your favourite comedy, and I, I call it comedy, it could be a comedy show, it could be a comedian. What is your favourite comedy? I've got, I love like Lee Evans. I think Lee Evans is, is just amazing. His energy is amazing. Every <laughs> part. I like all of those, um, probably a bit of innuendo kind of stuff with Kevin Hart. And I just find them unpredictable, which makes it even more funnier sometimes, doesn't it? But yeah. Lee Evans, I watched on stage at the O2. And I've never seen a man sweat so much for walking up and down a stage. Yeah. Like he put so much energy into it. Uh, I think he's retired now, which is a shame. But yeah, brilliant. And and uh, like if you know, you, especially if you're UK and everything, there's we've got a few out there, haven't we? We really have. So um, yeah, yeah it's, uh, Mickey Flanagan. I love all. I love, I think it's the innuendo stuff. I just find it where it's inappropriate it makes people feel uncomfortable. Sometimes it's nice to watch people feel uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, well, if, you, if you're talking about feeling uncomfortable, the, the best one for that was always Frankie Boyle, wasn't it? Yes, uh, yes. They, they, they Boyle, stopped yeah. having him on. Um, like, I think he got a weekend. little bit uh, too, um, too out there, didn't he, Frankie Boyle? <laughs> yeah, for the BBC, he definitely did. I mean, the BBC, he you've got to tell a certain no one line. recognised him. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I know Lee Evans... Um, he, he was great, and um, I know he lived around Southend at one point. 
um, for a while. And he, he, he said that he was nervous and he expressed the nervousness. Yeah, and I think that's it? why people related to him more, I think. Yeah, they did. Right. Yeah. They did. And he, he, you know, he just sort of, you know, collapsed on the stage and did these, <laughs> these funny things. But, I, you know, I, I, saw, I saw him on a, it was a recorded show. I never went to see him live. And, and some poor guy in the audience got up to go to the toilet. And he made such a thing about this guy. He said, where are you going? <laughs> oh, I haven't finished yet. Where are you going? <laughs> and he's like, what are you, so what are you going for? Was it ones or twos? And, oh, and that's then, <laughs> And then when the guy came back in the room, he said, oh, hang on a minute. He's back. He's back, everyone. He's finished. You know, it was <laughs> it's very clever. Oh, very fella, clever. What did you just probably wanted the ground to swap <laughs> yeah, him. <laughs> no, I'm surprised he came back in, to be fair. But, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's... Uh, I, I love all that. I think British humour, very different from American humour. Totally. Very, very I think different. that's what it is. I mean, it's totally, um, yeah, I think in today's world, I remember when I was younger, my, my grandparents used to watch porridge and things like that. And I think the difference in the humour there to what is like, you know, <laughs> you've just got to be able to take things on the chin, haven't you, and not be, take things personally in life, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it doesn't pay to be too serious, does it? No, be that's, it. that's exactly it. No, that's cool. Well, look, thank you for your time today, Kirsty. Um, really enjoyed uh, having you on, on the broadcast and also getting to know you a little bit more in a favouritism round. So um, we're, I know we're going to be holding um, a workshop um, a little bit later this year, aren't we? Um, yeah. With regards uh, to, to what you're doing, um, which, um, hang on, I'm just going to... I suppose I'd better say the date while we're talking about it. That might that might that oh, might actually help. Yeah, Patrick, there we go. That, that would be a good bit of promotion to actually to, to, to say the date. So it's Friday the 14th of October. Um, and uh, there, there will be uh, tickets available for that. So um, so all good. I've I've managed to, to find the date. <laughs> so um, we should look forward to that and uh, thanks ever so much for your time and uh, goodbye everybody uh, thank you very much, take care yeah thanks a lot <laughs>